As we agreed, the last two weeks of this series were for the advanced class. <laughs> the biggest dreamers, maybe. Dr. Stevens, I'm a little concerned. I perceive a lot more sleeping during Mass now. People just tell me they're working on their dreams. But seriously, uh, you are awakening our symbolic part of our minds and hearts and okay. souls, and, and it's like breathing again. I mean, to live in such a linear, scientific, material world with no symbols, no, uh -huh. uh, yeah. is not to be human. And so I, I'm grateful not only for helping me with my dreams, but, but also resuscitating a dimension of heart and soul in our community. So oh, we turn you. things back over to you. Thank you. More. Thank you, Father Steve. That's great. Good uh, evening and welcome back, all you hearty folks. Um, this is our third class. We've got one more after this. Uh, today we're going to look at some rules for dream interpretation. They're not quite papal rules. They're from psychologists, okay? Uh, we'll look at a, a way of analyzing people's personality. Um, there are a number of different systems for doing that. This one is called transactional analysis, um, and it is very helpful for self-understanding and for understanding dreams. And then we'll do a number of dreams just to do dreams. Um, There we go. Uh, last week we did a number of dreams. A uh, woman by the stream where her husband says it's okay to spend some retirement. Waterfall dream where the dreamer finds it's not so scary. In fact, it's pretty wonderful. A uh, woman who moving on in life and it's depicted in her dream as being able to get up and drive an 18-wheeler. Really pretty impressive. And then Carl Jung's lock and key dream, down the stairs to a door that's locked and what's behind it, okay? And in his case, um, he felt excitement, interest, something leading him on to turn the key and go through. Those dreams are informing of where we are they're affirming, they're positive dreams, and they're confirming, in some cases, what we're already doing. You're doing good, this is well, you're feeling good about it. Uh, and the woman by the stream, as I was going through my notes, uh, who meets her hubby, who's deceased, reminded me of Psalm 23, lead me by the still waters. That's a nice one. Then we had two other dreams, the woman who backed up her car and in the dream ran over her two-year-old. Uh, and that one is definitely a, an alerting dream and a correcting dream. And it, as we said, wasn't about backing up better. It was about the two-year-old being part of herself and she's got to start taking care of herself before something happens to her. And then we had a woman in a huge house, hardly anything in it, a little bit of furniture. She explores empty rooms, and there are one or two rooms. When she opens the door, she's terrified. Um, contrast that with Carl Jung's dream, we're opening the doors, excitement and encouraging. Uh, this woman, um, uh, probably, and she talks about emptiness, needs to get together with someone to discuss her life. And Father Richard Rohr says, if you have a fearful figure in a dream, ask that figure what it is uh, she or he is trying to tell us. And I don't know how you do that while dreaming, but writing the dream down and journaling it, that's a good time to sort of have a little conversation with some of the characters in the dream 
who of course are down in our memory and our subconscious. So Carl Jung's dream down the stairs, a uh, door locked at the very, very bottom, and he feels good feelings, uh, supportive feelings of anticipation, discovery, expectation. And you know that this uh, stuff is really uh, pretty uh, significant and accurate um, when the cartoonists get to it. Did I show you this cartoon in the first? Okay, good, that's why it's here. So Rose is finding a trap door on, under her living room, down the stairs like Carl Jung, finds a locked door, has a key, and uh, discovers something significant inside. A treasure box, a mysterious box, What's in there? It's part of herself. I just kind of liked that dream and thought it'd be nice to share it with you. Okay, there are, uh, I think someone asked me after last class, what about these really short dreams? Do they mean anything? And um, Carl Jung had a nice short dream that he reported. And his dad had died. Um, and he moved into his dad's old apartments uh, six weeks after his dad's death. And being a good rule-bound German or Austrian that he is, he worried that he's breaking some rules, that this is not kosher, this is maybe an unforgivable act. Take your dad's private place just because he died. Okay, and he had the dream many times. So that suggests something in there needs to be worked on. Uh, so he, in the dream, is apprehensive, guilty, ashamed, and is reproaching himself, blaming himself and scolding himself for doing this nasty thing. In the dream, his father appears. His father says, oh, I'm just coming back to look at the old place, and, um, and he's back on holiday and will be leaving. So the father in the dream, the father figure inside of Jung is saying, it's okay, you didn't do anything wrong. Um, and uh, it's an affirming dream. I can stay in my father's place and it is okay. Uh, the dream, however, got Carl Jung, one of the great psychiatrists in history, starting to think about life after death, as a number of people in my classes have when they have someone who is deceased show up in their dreams. And he got more into spirituality as a result of this little teeny dream and wonders if we do really return to our creator. Sounds like some good thoughts. Some uh, methods of dream interpretation to do some of the science of it before we do more of the symbolic. Um, first of all, significant dreams are not chaotic. They're not all over the place. They seem to have a real solid story. And it draws us back. We want to go back and see what else does that mean. Um, in significant dreams, the animals, persons, and things in the dreams, many of them, are symbolic parts of our inner self, as we'll see, or symbolic parts of emotional forces within us. Okay, in Jung's dream in his father's apartment, Jung has a lot of guilt. He got that much earlier than before his dad died, okay? And the guilt is coming out in the dream, and the dream, uh, so it, it represents a part of himself. And one of the most significant things to do in dream analysis is what are the feelings? Here we've got this animal, an elephant, it's significant. So what am I feeling in the presence of that? Uh, here are some people. What am I feeling in the presence of the person? Expectation or fear? 
and then that has to be looked at. Whoops, sorry, I had a great picture in my notes. There's the little box with her hidden self in there that she needs to discover, our good Lady Rose. Okay, as we said before, just reviewing in a way, uh, if we have a good dream and it's with us when we wake up, get up and write it down as soon as possible. Describe things in detail, don't just say, oh, you know, my dad appeared in a dream, ho-hum, let's go on with the day. What did dad look like? What, how did he walk into the dream? Speaking of Carl Jung's dad, uh, what, uh, uh, did he say anything? And get those details down. Uh, describe the places, things, and persons there. Uh, it would be great to do drawings. They don't have to be artistic. They just have to say, yeah, that's where the dream was. And then you look at that and you start describing it a bit and more things are coming out of one's self-conscious. Um, what are the major activities or themes in the dream? The major places or persons in the dream? Um, and major symbols and feelings are always important. This is not a, a thesis to be written in 100 pages in good English. This is symbolic, what is inside me and is coming out, so the feelings are very important. Um, do these dreams and symbols signify anything to me in my waking life? Carl Jung's dream, should I stay in my dad's apartment or is, is, is that uh, terrible? Uh, it has big significance in his daily life. The dream says, yeah, it's okay, your dad doesn't mind, okay? Um, what does it mean in our waking life? Uh, what does it mean to my spiritual growth? Uh, a little later, if you write this down and take a while close to the dream, you can come back the next day, you can come back two weeks later, and if it's a good dream, it's remarkable how much is still in there that comes to mind, especially if you talk it over with someone that you trust, and they say, what does that in the dream mean? And, and you say, I never thought of that. What does it mean? You start thinking about it, okay? And you write it down and that leads to something else. We'll see in some of our dreams. Uh, some suggest you can actively imagine where that dream would have gone if I didn't wake up. Uh, you notice Carl Jung talked to his dad about things. If, can he imagine himself doing it even though it wasn't in the dream? Uh, and um, what might have come before that dream that we didn't have in the dream, but once we start writing it down, we can think about it. Okay, the discussing of the dream with someone else is, is really significant uh, and very helpful sometimes. I'm not so great at analyzing my own dreams, uh, but when I ask, uh, we had a good clergyman, uh, a priest who was excellent at this, and my wife is very good about it, and she says, well, does this maybe mean such and such? And you say, oh my God, yeah, yeah, maybe that's what it means. So how do the interpretations fit my daily life? Give the dreams a title. I got one dream I think we'll do, and it's, it's called The Sour Angry Student. Uh, we will see if that's an appropriate title. Okay, and do interpretations click? If it clicks, you will know, like lights going on in a dark room. Is the dream repeated? And the interpretations of the dream reveal stuff about myself, especially stuff I wasn't quite so aware of. Okay, let's uh, do a, a system for understanding human personality. It's called transactional analysis. There are other schemes 
like Myers-Briggs, some of you hear about. Corporations use that to find out who is the more creative person, and you don't give them the detailed nitty-gritty, and the, the Myers-Briggs help you find out the person who hasn't got much creativity, but boy, can do the jots and tittles. So you can maybe aim people to the right type of job. And there's another really great personality typing, and that's the Enneagram. Um, comes out of the Middle East, it's been around for a couple thousand years, and the Jesuits have developed it up quite a bit. Uh, what emotions in me are more dominant? And that will explain a lot of my behavior. Am I more of a fearful person? Am I more of a reactive or aggressive person? Am I more of a helper person? And they have whole lists of things that go with that personality designation. So the tr transactional analysis is a way of looking at our own personality. There's a good book on that by the Jesuit up here at the top, uh, John Powell. It's called Why Am I Afraid to Tell You Who I Am? Nice, simple book and helpful. Okay, transactional analysis sees us uh, in this system or scheme um, as made up of uh, our adult, that's what we think we're all about and there's nothing else, but it says there's also within us uh, the memory of our parents and authority figures and how they treated us and what kind of raising and uh, respect or lack of respect they had for us. So those are called uh, parent tapes or authority tapes. Uh, what they happened to us in terms of adults treating us when we were little. And also within our subconscious are the memories of how we reacted to that as kids, okay? So uh, one of our parent tapes might be, dad tends to get angry on, once in a while, and our child, inner child, has a higher fear level or has a fear level around males or something. It's in there. It's in there. And now we are adults up here saying, well, I know what I'm doing and I'm simply making a decision and I'm thinking simply, but every thought has emotions tied to it. Shall I do this one again? A thought, simple, Republican. Democrat. Hormones go up. Uh, we have emotions that come right up, don't they? Okay, well they sure on a national level come up pretty strongly. Okay, so um, and this system uh, says that our adult has that child worry, child joy, whatever it is that comes up with our daily adult living and also have what parents have done to us or for us. And uh, transactional analysis is a way of understanding our interactions with people. Helps an awful lot uh, how I treat myself, think of myself, how I react with my spouse. So not that it solves everything or answers everything, but it gives some good clues, okay? or how I react to my children, other people, and it helps us in interpreting some aspects of our dreams. Okay, so the three psychological influences on us are our adulthood, where we think we're making all our decisions and thinking clearly and objectively, which is not quite true, uh, and the inner child who may be hurt, who may have been joyous, and that influences our decisions and our inner authority figure. You know, uh, what one parent used to do to me is still in there and it comes up in how I react. We'll see that. Um, so our thoughts and decisions, our consciousness is colored with emotions that come up from our subconscious. Uh, and have a lot to do with our childhood experiences. Our inner child can be 
have positive experiences, can have negative experiences. Our parent tapes are authority tapes. Authority tapes could be a teacher, a clergyman, uh, um, a police, a teacher, yeah, a police officer, something like that, uh, and how they treated me. What were their rules? How did they uh, get along? And those are still with me. Okay. Um, and so the uh, inner child and the parent tapes are kind of sneaky subconscious influences on what our adult is trying to do, and they show up in our emotional reactions, uh, and they show up in our dreams. Uh, transactional analysis in no way is complete. As we said, there are other ways of looking at people's personality. Uh, so, Uh, the inner child is the emotional memories of our childhood uh, uh, life. It's in our subconscious. It's with us, presumably, for life. Um, the inner parent are emotional memories from our childhood of how we were treated by uh, adults. They're with us, presumably, for life and in our subconscious. So let's look at those inner uh, memories. Uh, on the lower uh, right are parent or authority figure memories within us, okay? Some of them are affirming, uh, you're a nice kid. We're thinking back in our childhood, right? You're a nice kid, a wonderful daughter or son to have. I love doing things with you. We all got that, right? Uh, not from, not from some of people's experiences. Is the child welcomed into child, welcome into the church, or does the priest say, I don't do children blessings? Not right, okay? Children pick up on that. Uh, do we affirm and accept the child as a wonderful young person, uh, exciting and interesting? We as adults, how do we treat the child? They'll remember, okay? Uh, let's do something together. I love doing things with you, says the authority figure or the parent to this young child. So affirming uh, parent tapes are clearly supporting the child's self-worth, helping that spiritual growth. There are also wounding parent tapes where the parents were not so good or uh, the adult figures were not so good in treating children. Um, and that stays with kids. And when they, as adults, interact with one of you, that maybe nagging inner authority figure may come out. And they don't know it's coming out at that, but they think you did it. Okay, so that's the thing about the inner parent. So a wounding parent or authority figure, you're not such a good kid. Uh, uh, why aren't you perfect? Um, uh, the interesting one is where parents blame the kids for the parents' fault. We tried to do this, it didn't work right, and you made it go wrong to the child. Or as one, some parents say, you made me mad to the child. That's inaccurate terminology and bad psychology. The child did something that the parent reacted to, and the madness is in the parent. And they should be managing that, not putting it on the child to manage the parent's emotions. Uh, emotional abandonment. Don't bother me, I'm busy. I haven't got time for you. I don't like to work with kids. I'll wait till they're 20 or something. You know, that kind of child feels that, feels lost and abandoned. Emotional abuse, like name-calling, uh, building resentments in the child, uh, a church that's telling children if they do little things wrong, they're going right to hell, and they're going to burn for eternity. Boy, that doesn't kind of cheer up little kids, and it stays, 
and it stays in there and shaming the child. You never could do anything. Uh, you wet your bed at four years old. All this you can do to a child. It's a way of an adult controlling the child, but it's a way of wounding the child. Of course, physical abuse um, and the rules, the do's and don'ts. We all need some rules in child for children, but some are overdone. Uh, some are a source of you did it wrong, so I'm going to spank you and shout at you rather than you did it wrong. Uh, we do have these rules, so let's see what went wrong. We'll talk rather than get uh, abused. Um, rejection of the child's gifts and enthusiasms. I can do this. this my son came in one day, my son, with one of those cookie trays full of those white stones you put around the bushes. And he says, Daddy, how do you turn on the stove? I thought, oh my God. <laughs> One of the great things is to ask the child, what are you going to do? He says, well, I saw on TV, this is how you can make glass. So he's going to take our garden stone and put it, as opposed to shouting at him, telling him he's dumb, all that kind of thing. Uh, you can see how that builds um, the sense of who adults are and it builds in a person so that when we become adults we'll alter how we interact with adults. We've got these inner adult reactions. Okay, and of course this wounding decreases the child's self-worth and grows into an adult which has lower self-worth. The inner child on the left side is the child's reactions to those things the parents, adults, and authority figures did. And so if we treat the child uh, with affirmation, the inner child is more uh, healthy, um, happier, can love life. You're a neat child, you're a neat kid, let's do something together. Get away, I'm busy. There may be a difference. Child may grow up more able to accept others because when she, he was a little kid, she was accepted, right? Uh, and the child may grow up to have good personal boundaries. I work with people, but there's a certain point that they should not interfere with my personal life, whether that's on a moral level or a thinking level or uh, other things. Uh, good parents will teach a child, you don't let people do this to you. Okay, you've got a right to your person. Okay, so we can build a pretty healthy inner child. And incidentally, I don't want this to sound too perfect. It's not really either or. It's not this. It's, we're a mixture with weighting toward one side or the other. And also, um, except for me, no parents are perfect. So, um, no, we, how can we be, you know, in the match between the personality of a parent and the personality that comes with the kid is hard to do, so we're going to have struggles. So we're going to have some difficulties and some wounded inner child, inner child and some healthy inner child. Uh, wounded child is treated as though they're unwilly, uh, unworthy, is guilted a lot. You did that wrong. You should have done better. You're a bad girl. That's not so nice. Uh, left alone, emotionally abandoned. Parents don't spend much quality time with the child. It's going to grow up feeling rejected and feeling as an adult, deep down inside, nobody can love me. Didn't feel loved as a child. Um, we'll have maybe poor personal boundaries as an adult. Someone comes in and says, can you do this? I want you to do this. Can I tell me what you're, and you have a right to say, no, I can't. I, I'm too busy. No, uh, that's private. You don't need them. But a child who was raised by being embarrassed and not allowed to say, uh, I, I don't want to do that, is going to be an adult with weak personal boundaries. Wounded child grows up to an adult who thinks the world is unjust and bad. Uh, adult unable to be happy, to have fun, has a lot of fear, anxiety, 
and guilt in their adult life from the way it started as a child. Okay? Um, so that's what we have with this um, transactional analysis. And so the, whoops, you don't see what I'm pointing at. <laughs> Sorry. I, too hard to turn around. So the inner child, whoops, and the parent tapes are in us all and go to build uh, what kind of adult we will be. Uh, um, healthy parent raising, healthy inner child, and uh, the adult feels more self-accepting. We've got to accept ourselves. Uh, and it's not a sin, as some of us used to be told. Uh, becomes a child, uh, an adult with good sense of self-worth, feels uh, they are acceptable to other people, therefore can appreciate other people, can trust other people, uh, can be compassionate, generous, and they're wholer. They have more wholeness to them um, uh, because their inner subconscious is healthier. A child, I mean an adult, adult with uh, inner child and strong negative parent tapes turns out to be an adult who's more wounded, more self-alienated, got to protect themselves so they become more self-centered. Watch out for you, watch out for you, I got to, it's me, I got to be careful of me. Um, more defensive, more fearful, can't trust, uh, uh, guilt-ridden, some often say, uh, what happened? Did I do it? Am I at fault? This is an adult, and that's an often asked, that's telling you something about what has happened inside. Uh, can be rule-bound, I don't want to do it, I don't feel free to make something creative uh, because I have to get away from the rules. I was told never cross the street in the middle of the block, and even if the bus is going to run the child over on the other side, I can't do it. That's a rule. Um, there a book uh, by Corey Ten Boom called, uh, it's about hiding Jews in Holland. Uh, maybe it's the hiding place or something. And they're getting Jews out of Nazi Holland. And uh, the Jews come to her sister-in-law, who uh, is asked, you hide any Jews? you have any Jews in here? And she says, yeah, because Ten Commandments say, thou shalt not tell a lie. So inability to weigh the significance of a rule versus human. Uh, compassion. So these people who are adults with not such good inner child and parent tapes tend to have a hole in their soul, psychologists would say, tend to be cold-hearted. Uh, significant feel feelings in adult come from that inner child and those inner uh, authority figures which are in all of us. Okay, so how can this be helpful? Let's look at people interactions, maybe marriage, okay? He comes in and takes her favorite cup, hubby wife, and she gets angry and possessive. Ah, that's my cup. No one ever leaves my stuff alone. Uh, usually it's okay, we share that couple would. Okay, so what's going on? Well, she's having a rough day and her inner child is coming up, and her inner child had loads of experience with her siblings who took all her stuff, never returned it. So what hubby is doing is not fighting with, uh, what the wife is doing is not fighting with her hubby, she's fighting with that inner child experience of those siblings uh, that treated her unfairly by taking her stuff. Do you see how that works? Um, I'm mad at you, but really it's because down here I got stuff I never resolved in my own family. Um, she offers suggestions to her hubby on something he's doing, and he gets negative and angry. She's got great suggestions. How come he's getting negative and angry? His mom used to always make suggestions 
Always his mom, when he was a kid, helped. And by the time his mom got through helping, instead of his doing his project over here, his mom had him doing something totally different over there, just 180 on him. And he never gets to do what his little child curiosity uh, wanted to do. Uh, so um, his resentment comes out at his wife, but it's really resentment at how I was treated when I was a kid. Make some sense? Um, former churchgoer harbors deep resentment against the church and will argue and fume against church people or churchgoers. Uh, but really what's going on is down inside as a child, some clergyman didn't pay attention, didn't listen, uh, told her she can't do what she's doing and she's going to hell. Now that cheers a kid up, doesn't it? It sticks with her. And now she comes up and someone says, as, as a church member, can I help you? And there's no way she wants that help because the inner child, not her adult, her inner child is resisting. Um, one I like is she says, wifey says, let's do it this way, and hubby gets upset. How do you explain that? Well, you explain it by the fact that times before, she always said, let's do it that way. Okay? And hubby grew up in a family with all sorts of rules, and you damn well better not, excuse my biblical language, you better not break the rules or you get spanked. So hubby's got, let's do it that way, as a rule. He absolutely knows it's always going to be this way. And wifey says, how about a different way? And so that inner child comes out and gets a little tantrum. Um, and for this fellow, his dad and his church had absolute rules. Don't abs ever break them. Um, don't ever eat meat on Friday. Don't ever have something they eat in the back in the old days before communion uh, and the list goes on and that okay so this inner child and parent tape stuff is a great place to start for spiritual growth personal healing understanding what's going on uh, in our uh, relationships especially with our spouse and one way of healing is if we have negative inner adult uh, inner authority figure tapes, we have to switch them to more positive tapes. You know, inside one's memory, one's mind, think of how a parent should have treated me in that situation. Think of a parent who's kind and wants to be with oneself, affirming the child, you're a good boy, when the parents really back then said, you're a bad boy an awful lot. Uh, so, and to heal the inner child with some care and love. Think about that child. Think about some of the hard things and start saying, you're a good girl. You did wonder, you're so creative. You're, and this is the adult here talking to the memory child, inner child in there. Okay. Some dreams before you all fall asleep. Uh, before I fall asleep, that's not so good. Uh, in one of my dream workshops, a uh, Protestant minister noted this for me and gave me a copy. Um, do any of you know the song, The River of Dreams? This is so on to what we're talking about by Billy Joel. And here are the lyrics. In the middle of the night, I go walking in my sleep from the mountains of faith to a river so deep. Look at key words, river, walking, moving life on, uh, mountains. I must be looking for something I lost, something sacred I lost. That's healing the inner child, maybe. But the river is wide and it's hard to cross having to cross over from this part of my life to the next. This is a great song. Um, and even though I know the river is wide, I walk down every evening and I stand on the shore and I try to cross to the opposite side to finally find what I've been looking for. 
in life. That's a life moving on. In the middle of the night, I go walking in my sleep through the valley of fear. Scary dreams, scary parts of my inner self. Uh, I've been searching for something taken out of my soul. Well, there's a good American wording of stuff, I think. Something someone has stole from my soul. Um, I don't know why I go walking, at, go walking at night, but now I'm tired and I don't want to walk anymore. I hope it doesn't take me the rest of my life. Well, healing oneself probably does take the rest of one's life. I go walking in my seat, sleep through the jungle so deep, searching for something, something undefined. What is it my inner soul needs? God knows I've never been a spiritual man. I wade into the river that runs into the promised land. So many key words. Uh, I go walking in my sleep through the desert of truth. Uh, truth isn't so easy. It sometimes is pretty. Um, and a lot of the people occasionally do this in my class. I won't do it to you. How many of you people want me to tell the truth? All these hands go up. And then I tell them, well, my experience is people don't want the truth. They want to be told they're right. They want certitude, not truth, because truth we have to change. Okay, through the desert of truth and all end in the ocean, we all start in the streams. Uh, that's a life moving on and searching for things and sums up a lot of this lecture. Okay, a dream. Uh, it was entitled, it was uh, handed in, so we didn't get too much chance to talk with the person who, <clears throat> who had the dream. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, it's called, uh, I probably named it, The Fish That Got Away. Okay, this is an adult male in his 40s, has been in my class one of my classes. So, quote, during a little nap, I had a short but very clear dream. I dreamt I was in a fishing boat on a small lake. My son, about 10 years old, was not far away. Some symbols, sun, lake, fishing maybe. Uh, the sun was just right. I could see the bottom of the lake deep down inside. Uh, I could see very clearly, that's nifty, okay, in a dream and into oneself. Near the bottom were some very large, beautiful northern pike. Can you imagine something like that with neat colors of dark and light? Um, and to me, this was exciting and a joyful life, says the dreamer. And then the dreamer tells you later, he almost never has joy. So this is super significant. He doesn't know what joy is. Stopping what I was doing, I immediately dropped the line with a minnow on it uh, to the northerns. This was for my son to catch a big fish. I felt great enjoyment and eagerness to share the beautiful view and catch a big fish with my son. Uh, okay. Real life, father brings kid along, right? Uh, or is that symbolic? What does the sun, S-O-N, sun, symbolize? Maybe his own inner child. I need to bring along and show some excitement and show some beauty to that maybe wounded inner child in there. These were awesome and beautiful fish. That's a great dream start. So he goes on, my son somehow walked across the water to my boat and we set him up to fish. Uh, he never did figure out what walking across the water was about, all right? Um, my feelings, my son in my boat, he says, my feelings were wonderful. And somehow I felt I'd be rewarded with some neat catches to share with my son. Well, this guy said he never felt rewarded in his family. 
Certainly not by his dad who always said, you can do it better, that's not so good. How come you made a mistake? And that's a lifetime of parent tapes into inner child, right? So this guy's having a dream. I might be rewarded with sharing some of this beauty. Um, I hooked a big one and gave the pole to my son to fight and land, and somehow we lost the fish. Uh, he became very disappointed, no surprise, but he said in his usual life experience he was often disappointed. His real life uh, history or his parent tape sneaking into this joyful dream. So his great and joyful feelings drop lower. He gets more and more frustrated in the dream becomes anxious and fearful um, that he's losing this great enjoyment. Guy who doesn't know much about joy in real life, now in a dream has joy and the possibilities, where would this lead? Uh, and he's losing it, was his terminology. I'm losing the joy, okay? And I got angrier and wanted to share, but I wanted to share this with my father so I called my dad to come over to my boat. And while I sat in the boat, four by eight pieces, panels of plywood started covering the lake. And even if I tried to lift one and look inside, I couldn't see the beauty anymore. Okay, could this be his real life dad? Could this be his parent tapes telling himself it won't work? It's not worth it. It's Okay, um, I can no longer see the bottom nor the beautiful fish. Um, I tried to open a spot to show the fish to my dad, uh, but it was impossible to open even for a teeny view of what? The fish or the joy and the beauty. So the fish symbolizes maybe joy and beauty. And then my dad said in the dream, uh, there aren't any fish anyway, and you can't catch them anyhow. Now, there's a positive support for the uh, child's experience. Um, and I felt, says the dreamer, uh, no longer free and that things were not beautiful. And a large northern dead floated to the surface. Whew. We got some symbols in here. The beauty and joy is in the looking at the fish, and now it died on him, okay? He got more frustrated than anger. In real life, he deals with frustration and anger a lot. And he yelled at his, he said, my wonderful innocent son. I yelled at him and then immediately felt shamed. Um, okay, his first thoughts was, uh, this is how his father often treated him, uh, spoiled his fun, wouldn't let him follow through his desire uh, for adventure. The little guy with the real father, often his dad put a damper on his ideas and wishes and did say it won't work out to him many times. Um, and he said it wasn't until the stream and into his 40s that he realized how negative his dad had been all his childhood. He just bound out. Uh, dad never said, I'm proud of you, never said good job, doesn't presently in his adult life ask how his life or family are going, doesn't ask. Uh, still criticizes his full-grown son who's doing fairly well. Um, okay, though and as a kid in real life, dad took him fishing a number of times and he really, and taught his son to fish, and he really enjoyed it. Okay, so what do we got here? What, what do we got, a goofy dream? Uh, uh, well, at any rate, some symbols and ideas. The deep water could be within himself, into his subconscious, looking way down there, and there's beauty in there, in his subconscious. If in the waking light you talked to him, he said he wouldn't, he wouldn't believe you. But they're in that dream deep inside. Um, and uh, the fishing and the beautiful fish was great pleasure, joy, exciting. 
and he said, I'll be rewarded if I can catch some fish. And that was significant, like I said, he didn't get rewarded very often in his life. His son, maybe his inner child, part of himself, that hurt child in there, he's trying to do something to rehabilitate the child, give that child a more positive uh, view of life. So, um, uh, so, maybe his dad is not the real dad out in the world, but his inner parent tapes. He absorbed so much of that negativity from his real dad when he was a little kid, it's still in there and it keeps coming up when he is an adult. So, a uh, good way to see how transactional analysis might help us interpret some of our dreams. And I list this dream as an, an alerting dream and an informing dream. Getting some information there, he never knew. His dad was that negative, he just lived with it, right? And a correcting dream. We got to get something fixed here. Okay, any questions on our fishing dream? Let's move on. You don't get much time. Water okay. is, always the is water always the subconscious? Probably not, but many times. But many times is. Into the self, yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's what the dream specialists tell us. Yeah. Okay, another dream. The fella wrote this up and submitted it so we didn't have chance to talk to him because the real stuff comes, let's sit down and talk. What is this, you know? So if you can't do that, you gotta do a little more guessing. Okay, here's uh, a guy who's had a recurring dream for 50 years. He was in one of my learning and retirement classes uh, his dream goes back to his college days uh, where he had the usual dreams, he said, of not finding his locker, not finding his classroom, and not being prepared for classes. I thought that was a professor's dream. I didn't know students had those too. Okay. Um, but this dream, he says, is different. This one is more significant. I've not been able to pass an exam trying dozens of times. Um, I need it to get my degree and to graduate. The dream is always the same. The course was very complex. I didn't understand it. I was not familiar with it. I never comprehended it. Uh, the instructor was very cold as a person, didn't care. He was somewhat elderly. I hope he didn't mean me. Um, he didn't care whether you passed or not. There was very little help. Uh, he was unavailable. I had a few of those. Uh, he didn't want to take time to discuss my difficulties with the course, and consequently, I regularly failed. Uh, my other classmates had no trouble, and I was left behind. So, um, What's really interesting to the dreamer is he kept doing it, going back, re enrolling, and failing. Okay? As he said, being denied a good grade. Some of that wording is significant. Okay? Who's denying him? Okay? Um, and I was always crushed. So here's what I came up with because he, he wasn't there. Um, how about the elderly, uncaring professor being symbolic of someone significant in his life? Want to guess? Dad, yeah, dad's getting a bad rap today. His dad maybe again. Listen to the descriptive words. Didn't care, cold person, very little help, left me behind, didn't teach me. Being, I was being denied by him. He was unavailable. What is that is a whole pile in the 
subconscious in the parent tapes uh, department there, the way he was treated. The inner youth, youth, the student, would be himself when he was younger. I felt left behind, I'm quoting the dreamer. I tried and I failed at the tests. What tests? What do the tests symbolize? Maybe winning dad's approval once? Just once, would that be good? Okay. Uh, and then he retried, re-enrolled, retook the test. He says year after year, and this dream was with him for a couple of decades. So it's not the professor, right? It's something far more significant. He always looked forward to the results of the test. He tried, he did his best, and he was crushed every time. Now, if this is the inner father, it would be great to talk to this guy about this. Um, then you'd like to ask him how many times did he, how did he try? Is this really what he's after, father's approval, father's affection? It's been known to happen, okay? Uh, how the test that he fails is how to get the idea of how to get dad's of, uh, attention. He's an apparently abandoned child in the sense dad can be all there, but dad's not paying any attention, right, back then. And now as an adult, he's trying to figure out, can I still get dad's attention? I'm trying to think it's not coming to mind. Someone I knew was doing that for years. Can I only get... And I only get one of those parents, you know, to respond to me. Uh, he can't comprehend how to pass dad's test. Okay. In real life, he's a successful engineer, and he really worries that he can't make it. Is that worries about his engineering, where he's successful, or worries from that parent tape and inner child? I didn't make it with my parents or my dad. He turned down promotions uh, because he feared he'd screw it up. Uh, and maybe he didn't say this, I'm wondering, he has those fears in other areas of his life and he's not going to try there either. Injured inner child affecting uh, adult. Uh, So I'd say his dream is informing. Do you get the point? Well, he'd get it if he had someone to talk to, where that kind of would light bulbs. It's alerting something hasn't been going right for all these years, and it's clarifying if you're able to get some help to interpret that dream. Okay? Um, incidentally, Forgive me if I'm off track here, but I did suggest to a few people that if people in the class were interested, you guys could form a little discussion group and share some dreams. I've suggested this to many of my dream classes. It's never worked, so don't feel bad if you fail the test. But nevertheless, it would be fascinating. Okay, dreams interesting? We're getting an insight into people, deep down into who they are. Okay, um, this was at a workshop I gave at Green Lake for the UWGB Ecumenical Center. I uh, had about 40 students and uh, we shared dreams. It went great. Those students were so into uh, what do you think about this other person's dream? What do you think the symbol means? It was going great. A Mexican male student about 22 years old shared a dream. He's looking very much forward to visiting back home in Mexico, but he's got huge anxiety over it, okay? Because he can't arrange in his dream. I can't get a return ticket to Green Bay. I can't get the damn thing. And he had this dream many times, okay? So some major th symbols are a return ticket, a uh, symbol is traveling away from some place he liked, away from UW Green Bay. He really liked it there. He's got to go. And um, so, in a real life, he was going to a wedding, really going to a wedding back in Mexico. He was a graduate student, 
wished to continue his studies, of which he was very proud and very committed. Lord, if only we had more of those students. Sorry, it's a good place for a prayer. At any rate, uh, we did have a lot of great students. So, um, And he likes his present student life at UWGB. Could have the same thing at UWSP, okay? Anxiety, what might it be? What can we interpret? Well, going home, he's going home to big pressure from his mom and dad to stay at home. I've got at least three or four foreign students with that same problem, okay? Come home where you belong. And his parents are big pressure, so they're a strong figure, you know, that he is afear, afraid of. Uh, maybe he's afraid that when he goes home, all that anxiety is a fear that he'll be treated as a kid again. Go home. Here he is really doing something well, developing an adult life, make his own cho making his own choices, aiming his life. And now he's going to go home and have to follow all the rules for a child back at home. Um, I had a gal after this uh, discussion come up, and she's a 50-year-old woman. She said, not the Mexican male, but a different person. 50-year-old woman who seldom visits her folks because they treat her like a child of 10 years old. Parent tapes treating someone, a child, in such a way and not allowing them to be adult. Okay, so our Mexican student, I think, is afraid he'll lose his adult life, lose control over his own future, which is going well. Um, and anxiety that his adult choices will not be respected at home. That sound fit? Okay. So I thought the dream was informing and alerting, and he's got to do something. This is years ago, so I don't know what he did. I hope he did something good. He clearly at least should discuss with his parents, maybe on the phone before he goes there, what his plans are, and that he is choosing the plans, not mom and dad, okay? Uh, he has to make a decision. He's waffling. Uh, respect and honor to parents, uh, me as the young adult trying to make a life. He's got to make that decision, alerting dream, informing. Uh, okay, and he's got to make it plain to his parents if he goes, he darn well is going back to... UWGB. And a fascinating thing. We had this group of students in a semicircle and they're chatting, they're having a great time. And a male student from India said, Oh my God, I have the same dreams. Symbolic dreams sometimes cross cultures. This Indian student, a native Indian, no, uh, got to get it right, Asian Indian student. Uh, has already got round-trip air tickets from Green Bay to India and back. In his dream, he tries to use those tickets and leave India, uh, but they won't let his return ticket, uh, they won't accept it because it's invalid. And I thought, well, you know, back in the old days, you fly somewhere, you got to call and reval. And no, I don't think it's that. I think it's who's going to validate his ticket. The airlines or his parents when he gets home? Which validation does he really, really need, okay? So he's got huge anxiety, uh, emotional stress, and pressure. He's 28 years old, really going home to India in about six months to face his parents and his future bride whom they picked out. Cheer up, we got it all fixed for you. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, okay, um, and he's having anxiety attacks. His goal is to finish his doctorate here in research so he can do something and go back to India and contribute. That's what he would like to do. Does he get to do it? Uh, along with this dream, the student from India had dreams where he's trying to catch a bus going away from town and he's so small, inner kid, his little legs can't catch up to the bus and he can't get going away from town, okay? 
He also has a recurrent dream. He's being chased by wild and dangerous animals and can't get away because he can't wake up fast enough and uh, can't run, can't run fast enough and wakes up in great anxiety. Okay, so what's chasing him? What's trying to grab and keep him? Symbol for maybe his parents, you know, and those cultures, that's a tighter thing. The parents tell you exactly how your life will go, um, uh, more so than in the U.S., though we have that too. Uh, so he's got, again, an informing or an alerting dream. He's got to get things straightened away before he gets to an environment where he's overwhelmed by pressure. Okay. Do these kind of ring true to you some ways? Okay. Um, um, okay. Uh, back at that Green Lake Ecumenical Center retreat that I was running, I, the priest and the Protestant minister were running it. Thank heavens I was just presenting uh, two and a half days worth, worth of dreams. Uh, and again, as I said, numbers of students presented their dreams. They were discussed. They had a grand time. Um, and it was pretty open, really. Um, and then um, a, a, a woman student uh, wanted to contribute. Um, she um, was 22 years old, looked very negative, acted very negative. Uh, first session in our weekend retreat. This is Friday evening. Everybody's there after dinner. I start talking about some of the archetypes uh, for Jung and giving them a sense. And she charges in and starts saying, none of this male-female stuff makes any sense. It's bogus. It's... And she goes on for 15 minutes at the beginning of my workshop just takes it, all, and she has anger coming out, it's just spewing out. Okay, um, uh, her, she was sour in facial appearance. Um, she was alone in the student group, bunches of students, and then her, all alone. Um, and that may not be yet, because the students didn't figure her out yet. That was her, maybe, wanting to be alone. Um, um, her views and, and spewing her anger was more important to her than the 39 other students getting to know what's going to be going on. Okay, her dream. Okay, we've discussed a lot of dreams in this workshop, her turn. Her dream she has many times that her close female friend, uh, roommate, was very interested in saving money. Okay, the roommate could possibly be a spirit guide for her, part of herself, and the money symbol symbolizes what? Things important in one's life, not necessarily cash. Okay, so her female friend and roommate uh, is very interested in sa saving money, um, which may represent valuable energy or valuable self-worth and her roommate insists on going to a seminar by a male speaker. I wouldn't normally say that, but she didn't like it that the speaker was male. Okay, the dreamer does not want to go. She thinks it's useless and worthless. Okay, why did she come to my workshop? <laughs> oh well, didn't quite fit the plan. Her female friend uh, insists and expresses a deep need to go. A uh, uh, female friend could be a spirit guide. The need is to look into something vital to life, the money situation, symbol of vital to life, or knowledge of herself. So they both go, the dreamer person being very negative and resisting, but going. Uh, the seminar given by the male speaker was very interesting to her friend and roommate, but not to her, okay? At the end, the male speaker starts telling them how they can save money, symbol of how can you value 
your, or heal yourself, maybe, you think? Okay. Um, and she decides, the dreamer, this is against all the rules and will not do it. So she applies her maybe anti-male rules to this and she has nothing to do with it. She tells the group that she was incensed, believed the speaker was worthless and dumb. You can leave that out of your course evaluation if you wish. Um, she says her friend is now bothered by the speaker too and she drags her friend back to the apartment and she's had this dream many times. Okay, so uh, one might think the woman friend is perhaps a spirit guide trying to get something, it says money, but something to do with healthy life, improved significance. Um, we're going to discuss the stream. I open it to the whole class of 40 students. You know what they said? Nothing. This is the most quiet class I've ever had. No one was going to touch that, uh, especially with the anger she had. And guess what? The presenter didn't want to touch it either, so it did not get discussed. Okay. Um, so she's got something urging in herself to look for something that can improve her life, may or maybe fill a hole in her soul. And she's resisting that. Um, maybe she's negative and hostile to something inside her own self. Those parent tapes made a little child that really doesn't like itself. That's possible, okay? Um, and the speaker, the uh, male guide, could be a potential source of something if she wanted to work on it, and she damn well won't, uh, okay? So, is she rejecting ideas that might save something valuable in her life? We won't know because we never developed this thought, but it's a significant dream. Um, so, a uh, thing that comes to mind for me, since I, sa I told you I sat in on different counseling sessions uh, to get some idea of the practical part of our psychology rather than what I taught, which is the textbook part, you know? And in one of those sessions, there was this angry woman. And uh, it was a group session, everybody's supposed to ch share, but once she got talking, nobody had a chance. And she was bitter about this male in her life, this male in her life, this male in her work, this male in her church, this, it just went on. It was overpowering. Different woman, okay? Different location. And as the counselor talked to her, slowly eking out ideas and thoughts uh, from her, what, what's going on? Uh, maybe like that figure with the first dreamer, trying to find out what's going on in her life. Uh, the counselor cut, gets her to say she was abused as a girl by her father and her uh, brother. Now there's a source for an inner child with an awful lot of anger. And an interesting thing uh, in her dreaming or in her trying to, she didn't remember, right? This is suppressed, she didn't remember. What the key to remembering was, she kept saying, I see colors. She's in anger, she want, the counselor's trying to help and I see colors, I see red, I see yellow, I see blue. I say, well, what are the colors? And you work on that for a while. It's in a circle, the colors are in a circle. And, you, and there's some shapes in that. And it finally comes out, what she visualized when she was being ab abused is the rose window in the back of many churches. That was in her mind while she was being ill-treated. Okay, well, back to our UWGB student. She needs some help. She certainly seems, her dream was informing, but she wouldn't let it. It was alerting, okay? She's not getting it. It's correcting, you gotta do something different. Uh, and her dream demands a response repeated many, many times. What can, she's gotta see someone, clergyman, counselor, to get that 
hole um, filled up. Okay, maybe time for one more, a more pleasant one. I, I do try to, okay. Uh, this was at that same conference in Green Lake, and it's named The Woman in the Tub. Okay, not what you may start thinking from our, well, ever. Okay, the dreamer tells us uh, she's a 35-year-old woman and a college student. That's, that's what we used to call an older adult student because the 18-year-olds wanted to be adults, so you had this some way to tell you you got someone with life experience. But uh, a little unusual for someone that age to be in college, so she's working on something. Okay. Um, in her dream, she knows a number of her friends have a serious disease. She tries hard to help them and to find a cure for the disease, uh, and she's unable to do it. Her friends have a disease, she's trying to help. She then contracts the disease and continues the search for a cure. She finally finds a cure which helps herself, but it's too late to help her friends. Um, though they don't die. So she feels guilty. Uh, in death, uh, in tragedies, the survivor has survivor guilt. Why me? Why didn't I die too? How come my best friend died or my military buddy? So she's feeling guilty that she got a cure and they can't get it in time. The cure is, you'll love this, the cure is to sit in a warm, comfortable bath, relax, and find it peaceful and pleasant. That's okay. In, in psychological terms, it seems to symbolize caring for oneself. I gotta do something, you know, take a little time off, um, take myself out to breakfast, you know, meet with a friend, all those little curative things, okay. Okay, so she's peaceful and relaxed in the bathtub, but the bathtub doesn't have any sides to it. Now this got the students kind of interested, okay. She's in a bathtub-shaped volume of just water with no metal on it. Okay, some symbols, the tub and the water, what do they mean? Uh, herself, uh, what does it mean that she was cured? What are her friend's disease? And I suppose, why isn't there a metal thing around the tub? Um, she's a 35-year-old in real life, single mom, two kids, dedicated mother, lively, she's lovely, mature, talented, experienced woman uh, who had this dream. She's also a recovering drug user and recovering alcoholic. She tends to be overly controlling, and she's a perfectionist, which isn't so healthy. Perfectionists are pretty hard on themselves. One student says, ah, oh, what she has to learn is letting go, get away from obsessive uh, perfectionism. Uh, that's self-enslavement, so you gotta be freer with yourself, more open for yourself. Well, a bathtub fits that. Okay, um, um, she had an illness and the cure is herself doing the cure. She has to want to, as opposed to our previous gal, okay. Um, second student says, boy, what a peaceful bath, no sides, healing yourself. Uh, maybe without the sides, it implies uh, freeing oneself, liberating oneself. You know, instead of in this little thing, everything's out there for you. Expanding oneself, okay, which is the opposite of confining and imprisoning. Not bad for 20-year-old college students to come up with, okay. Maybe, said a third student, this is a rebirth. This is a new baptism to a freer, happier, life, opening up a new life. Um, okay, um, had a great experience with a 
a priest who said, you know, you got to loosen up a bit, Rick, which people have been telling me for 40 or more years at least, along with the people who kept saying that I'll give you a dictionary because your spelling stinks. Okay, I'm supposed to loosen up. And the priest says, why don't you go, we're in uh, Door County, why don't you just go and take a swim? I, that sounds good. So I pull into the parking lot for the beach and uh, keep my Bermuda shorts on, keep the keys, thank God, he didn't lock myself out, left everything in the car, went in the water, had a great time. He said, loosen up, be free. So I get out of that, I feel super great. I'm tooling down highway, what is it, 41? Goes into, well, the highway from Sturgeon Bay to Green Bay. And I hit Brussels Hill, big steep hill. That's where I found out cop cars radar works both directions. They don't have to be behind you. They can get you this way. And I saw the lights turn around. And the female cop was really very nice, but I couldn't talk her out of 92 bucks for loosening up. I, I maybe tightened up a little more there. Okay, our gal in the bathtub without a side is maybe freeing herself for more life than the confines of drugs. Rebirth, rebaptism, uh, a cure. That's what I have for today. And so thank you for your attention. Do we have some questions? Do we have input? You're sharp people with lots of experience. Your input would be pretty valuable. Yes. I don't know if anybody addressed her friends who weren't cured that she was feeling guilty about, but could that be herself, like her former self, trapped in the, in the drug alcohol area and her feeling guilty for putting herself through that? <clears throat> That's very interesting. I never thought of that. She said, what if her friends who are still caught in the sickness is her former self trapped in there, that inner memory of being trapped with the drugs and the alcohol. And she, yeah, but she's cured from that. That's very interesting. If she were here, that's what you'd want to talk about. Do you think that might be something going on? Okay, great. Other stuff? Yes, please. correlation between what you remember of your dreams and how well you're resting and restoring yourself, you know? Any correlation between what you remember of your dreams and how well you're resting? Um, I don't know. I, I guess um, I'm trying to think. Um, Mary and I have talked about that, you know, went to the bathroom, couldn't get back to sleep. Is that when you have dreams? I have some nice dreams when I slam the don't wake me up thing on the alarm clock and go back to sleep for a while. I'm, I'm in a lighter sleep and, you know, things come to the fore. I, I don't know. I wish I knew and maybe some experts do know. Okay. So, yeah, Samuel. Okay, we got waking up and REM sleep. Yes. So you don't. So it's like you don't. Um, you're in a deep sleep, so you, you don't aren't thinking about things. But when you go into REM sleep, your mind starts working faster. Yeah. Um, if you say you don't have dreams, uh, the scientists who put electrodes on your brain when you go to sleep say, yeah, you do, and they have sleep cycles and some uh, brain waves. Some of the brain waves get really deep and you are zonked, you know. Um, wake the person up at that time and they don't know what country they're in. You know, they really were deep. But then the sleep cycle goes up, this goes four or so times a night. And when it's higher, closer to awaking, um, the, the brain activity is higher. And they can watch your eyes under your lids and your eyelids are doing this. Okay, that's called REM sleep, rapid eye movement sleep. 
Okay, and you wake a person up at that kind of sleep, and they say, oh, I've been having a fascinating dream. So for those of you who don't think you have dream, get wired up and have someone wake you up at just the right time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes. I have just the opposite. I feel like I dream all the time and I never get deep sleep. And that goes along with your question because I wake up feeling like I'm tired because I dreamed all night and I didn't get any really good sleep. And my, yeah, and my, and my dreams tire me out. Dreams that tire her out and she dreams all night and she gets up tired. Um, it sounds like, you know, dream cycles, which can vary from person to person. Maybe you have more of that REM sleep, uh, relatively active brain than other people might. And that could be tiring. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Where does God fit in here? <laughs> Where does God fit in here? Yeah. Is in that these, the question? Yep. In the dreams. I mean, is it... You're unconscious. Is God giving you that unconscious gift? To uh, what was the unconscious part? So is God uh, working through your unconscious? Is to God bring working something through forward? your unconscious or your subconscious? Um, next time I talk to her, I'll ask. <laughs> but no, um, um, I would think, yeah. I, I'm not doing the God bit because our goodly priest, that's his job, and I'd hate to steal his thunder. I'm, I'm wimping out is what I'm doing. <laughs> but, um, you know, St. Peter said the uh, angel came in a dream. St. Peter said the angel came in a dream, and a dream in Jewish theology, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, an angel. In Jewish theology, is a messenger from God. Um, who did we have? Uh, Saint Joseph. Don't put the woman away. That idea. Mary uh, came to him. Uh, an angel came to him in a dream. Messenger from God. So could God be giving people little hints and directions? I, I guess I won't conflict with that. That why not? You know. He sure does through my wife. <laughs> that was supposed to be a little <laughs> funny. When I think of that, I, you know, I just imagine, too, that, that you know, God invites us to know our, our most essential, deepest self, right? You know, the, um, the eternal part of our self that uh, never dies. And, uh, and how else do we do that? You know, that's not a place we live in our conscious mind very often. So um, perhaps deepening our understanding of our subconscious helps us with that. Yeah, and what about, um, I had a, a, you meet someone and you start learning from them and maybe you don't have much time, but you say, wow, what a, I learned, a, I, I grew from that. Is that just one person we bumped into, or is that something sent by God? I had a wonderful experience in London. Uh, I was at a conference on science, and, and, uh, and uh, I met at breakfast the gal who was at a conference for pharmacy, and we got chatting. And she started telling me about her dream. See, did God send me to talk to her? <laughs> okay. but. She talked about a, a dream with pathway, with a, a roadway, a roadway like you see down south to the mansion, trees all over. And her dream was how the roots are interacting and touching, how the branches are interacting and touching. This gal's a pharmacy technician, I thought. And she said, that's how our world is meant to be. We should be like this together. Now, is that an accident? Uh, is that uh, 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 a chaotic event? Or was that a gift? Yeah, so uh, I have a list of gifts that I think if God doesn't exist, these might say, maybe she does, you know? 
One is my wife. The accidents that went into meeting that lady are numerous. Just shouldn't have happened. Anyhow, other questions, ideas? Yeah, are there any other questions? I, and I just wanted to make another uh, quick comment. You know, as you describe the dreams that you've been sharing with us, you speak about, you know, different um, emotions that as Christians we might tie to our, um, our inner life, compassion, forgiveness, things like that. Um, and it came to me recently that uh, because we're talking so much about listening in our parish related to the synod, but I think there's a kind of listening that must go on in dreams. And I've been wondering recently if listening isn't the foundation of the spiritual works of mercy, that we have to be able to listen um, to ourselves and to another in order to accompany them in suffering, to, you know, encourage them in their own imprisonment, whatever that may be. Yeah. And Those listening is one of your goals? One of my goals? Uh, one of the One of Holy the parish's Spirit. goals. I, yes, yes. So listening to oneself? is a valid listening, right? Mm -hmm. Listening to the Spirit wherever, yeah. Uh, and well, I have, remember, we have one more class. Um, I smell incense, which takes me way back to my inner child. I was an altar boy at the incense thing here, and the smoke was going furiously right in my face. I thought I was gonna die right there on the altar, but I wasn't. Okay, and next class, uh, same time, same place. We're going to just do a lot of dreams. Okay, we've got some really good dreams. Um, a dream of a middle-aged, later-aged lady. Um, I'm losing it. Uh, uh, yeah, my brain is a little fried. That's right. So. Lots of dreams. Okay, but we got some good ones. No well, more bathtubs. Thank you so much for being with us again this evening. You're welcome. Dr. Stevens, thank you. Boy, does the incense bring one back. Okay, thank you all. Thank you. Hope to see you next week.